Um, when we're children, we develop enthusiasms. Enthusiasms that stay with us the rest of our lives. So that might be an enthusiasm for sport, an enthusiasm for um, acting, an enthusiasm for model railways, all sorts of things. And the enthusiasms we develop then, they keep with us, they stay with us into our adult lives. And the important thing about that is that if we are enthusiastic about something, and we care about it, we want to do something to look after it, and we worry about it if it gets damaged. It's really important that we get our children enthusiastic about the world around them. And the best way of doing that is really getting children out into the environment. So you've got a child here out in a, uh, exploring and, and enjoying a waterfall, but unfortunately a lot of children in the UK and around the world today don't have access to waterfalls every day. They don't have access maybe to the beach or woodlands. A lot of children we've already heard grow up in very urban environments. So it's particularly important that these children get access to the outdoors so that they can learn to love the outdoors and care about it. Then when they grow up as adults, they'll want to uh, take care of it. So what I'm saying today is one of the best places you can do that, one place that every child, every school child has access to, is their school grounds. So, what do sustainable school grounds actually look like? Well, that's a fairly typical uh, school grounds, I, I guess. You'll be pleased to know that school is actually being rebuilt, so um, it won't stay like that for much longer. But that is the environment that a lot of our children uh, spend time in. Um, it's a pretty grotty building. It's probably single glazed, very environmentally unfriendly. And uh, the playground is even being used as a car park. Uh, there is a little bit of green at the edge. Uh, you see there's a few uh, trees planted at the edge, a bit of woodland. But it's really not an environment that's saying to our children, the environment is important to us. We're not sending out good messages. Maybe if all our children had an environment like this, they would. This is a school in, in South Africa, and they have 270 acres of uh, wildlife area. <laughs> Unfortunately, not the reality for most schools in the UK. And this is a school in Western Australia. So again, not like most schools in the UK, but what they are doing in Western Australia is every school, every new built school, what they're doing is making sure that they retain a bit of the native bushland on site so that the children at the school understand their natural heritage. But even in this country, even if you've got a green or grey desert actually in your school grounds, some schools still have access uh, to the environment around them and wonderful environments. This is actually the same school as I showed you in that first image. But some schools, this is maybe all they can have, or all they have at the moment. But actually, taking care of something like that, if you don't take care of a little pot of plants, uh, that you know, will soon die and soon diminish. So it's, it's starting to learn, maybe on a small scale, about what it means to look after our environment. What it means to look after wildlife and encourage wildlife into the school grounds. Learning about good ways of doing things. Learning that actually, if you get into the habit of cycling into school, maybe you'll have the habit of cycling as you grow up. But it's also about creating environments. This is a school grounds, this is in Berlin. Um, creating play spaces and places that we send our children to in maybe 25% of each day that are wonderful places that they learn all about the environment just by being there. So how do you teach? children about sustainability through school grounds. Well, my first argument is you just get them outside. So, when they're very young, get them climbing trees. They're small children, it's a small tree. But maybe as they get older, we'll let them climb larger trees as well. But just getting them out there, getting them interacting, getting their hands dirty, getting muddy, really finding out what it is and just learning to love the natural world. Whatever the weather, doesn't matter if it's raining, sun is shining, or it's snowing, it's getting out and enjoying and interacting with the world around us. Going outside, building dens, having campfires outside, just learning about being outside and enjoying the experience of being outside. And we know that those children that enjoy being outside when they're young, they're the ones that will enjoy and care for their environment as they get older and become adults. And that could just be literally, sun is shining, let's go outside and let's work outside. Let's enjoy the world around us. So, the next stage for schools is to practice what they preach. Now this is something that I don't think they often do terribly well. 
Um, we hear about, oh, you must look after rainforests and, you know, must, we must care for our environment. Teachers telling the children that. But in reality, they're often not putting that into practice on the ground. So if every time they plant a new plant in their school grounds, they use yet another plant pot instead of recycling and reusing, that's sending out messages to the children that actually, we may tell you that you need to be sustainable, you need to care about the environment, but are we actually doing it? But instead, if maybe, uh, like this school, you make your plant pots into chess pieces. Uh, that's just another way of thinking about, actually, instead of buying something new, let's look at what we've already got and using it a bit better. Um, water is obviously a very important resource. And it doesn't matter, some schools collect water on a quite small scale, some on a rather larger scale. This is a, a school in California. When I, I went and spoke to some horticulturalists in South Africa a few years ago about um, school grounds, and the question they said to me, I was talking about water, and they said to me, well, how do you get water for your school grounds? And I said, well, we turn the tap on. And for us, that is incredibly obvious, we turn the tap on. For them, it wasn't. They had a real issue. How do we get water? They had to uh, drill boreholes to get the water supply in order to water uh, their grounds and their, and their food that they were growing in their school grounds. So it's something that we in this country maybe don't have to think about as much as some others. But we should be thinking about how do we care for the environment? Do we use pesticides? Do we grow fruit and vegetables in organic ways? How are we going to do it to make sure that we have a sustainable future? When we're creating a new school grounds, this again is another school in Berlin. It started off as a typical grey tarmac uh, desert. And instead of when they dug everything up, instead of just chucking that away, they used the paving stones, they used the bits that were dug up and, and taken away out of the first playground to develop the second school grounds. So they're really thinking, actually, as a school, we are showing that we're trying to be sustainable. Or at this school, where they're using recycled plastic to create uh, planting beds. Or what about the materials we use outside to create seating areas? Or if we're putting in play equipment, where are we getting our timber from? So that we're actually showing the children, yes, we're telling you this, but we're doing something about it ourselves. Or here, creating a very flexible form of seating by using the local resource. They've got a school surrounded uh, by farmland, so they're using the local resource of straw bales. And when we go outside, why not use the resources that we can collect in the, uh, in the grounds around us, whether that's chalk or making our own charcoal. So, another thing, we learn from the experience of others. Often, we think, oh, we know best in this society. And actually, many generations before us have done a lot better at looking after the environment than we have. So, for example, here in Australia, this is a canoe tree. Um, the Aboriginal people would cut the canoe out of the tree and the tree would continue to survive. It was something that they learnt to work with their local environment. Again, in Australia, uh, a bush tucker trail, as opposed to a bush tucker trial, but learning about how native plants are used. Again, in South Africa, children learning how the native plants have been used traditionally, as well as in maybe in modern day medicine as well. And we can do that in this country too. These are two different uses of willow. On the left hand side, that's a, um, a willow museum, an outdoor museum. At that school, what they did was they looked at the different trees in their school grounds and they found items that had been made out of those different trees. So they found lots of willow items and hung them up in the willow trees. They discovered pine items and hung them up in the pine trees. So the children see where things are coming from. But maybe the most important thing is getting the children to do it for themselves. Here, this is in South Africa again, where the children every week would collect, get a lemonade bottle and collect their bath water, some of their bath water, so they could come in and water the plants in their school grounds, learning how important it is and how important water is. A good bit of composting. I once said to a head teacher in this country, I said, uh, what about having a wormery in your school grounds? She said, worms, boys, no. But <laughs> fortunately, not every head teacher thinks that. This is another example. This is a solar panel that's actually uh, powering a water fountain, just a little fountain coming up. And you can turn the panel so that when the panel is facing the sun, the fountain is quite high. You turn it away, you see the energy is reduced, 
and the, the fountain low. So children are really engaging with what's happening. They're learning what it means to grow up their own fruits and vegetables. They're learning how to use sustainable systems of controlling uh, pests. This is um, controlling stopping coddling moths getting to the apples just by um, putting them in white paper bags. And they learn about growing their own fruit and vegetables and then they'll start to really appreciate that and start to eat them better as well. So we get children who eat better food as well as learning about their environment. So they may even learn to keep domesticated animals in their school grounds. Or think about how they have to develop their grounds in order to sustain wildlife and get wildlife coming and visiting their grounds. And if you've got good grounds for wildlife, then the chances are you've also got good grounds for children as well. So, a sustainable future, I think that should start in school grounds because that's where every child can access the outdoors every day. Thank you very much.